Okay, what's going on, guys? And welcome to a brand new episode of Energize. Today, we have a very special guest on the show. We have former professional footballer. This man has plied his trade at UCD, Sheffield Wednesday, Northampton, and many others. It's Mr. Paul Curry. Paul, how are you doing? How are you doing, guys? I feel a bit uncomfortable, a bit special guest, but we'll roll with it. Uh, Paul, you are one. Uh, well, like, we did ask off air who you support, so you may as well tell the folks at home what team you actually support before we kick it off. Yeah, I was born and bred in a diehard Chelsea household, so uh, we got over back and forth from the bridge pre Roman Abramovich era now. Not, not just a, a lobster uh, or a prawn. Prawn, prawn salmon salmon fan, you know, <laughs> Family have been there in the Rude Hullet days and the Frank LaBeouf days, so. Um, it's just been ingrained in me since since early. Yeah. Well, also, like I mean, obviously we're going to get into everything you've done in your career, but uh, you did also mention that you got you swapped shirts with Frank Lampard when you played against Man City in the FA Cup. Uh, that's something that you should definitely just tell us about before we kick off everything. Because it's a great story already, like you know. Yeah, it was, and it was. I think it was my second year, or maybe my final year at Sheffield Wednesday, and uh, we played Man City twice that year. We got them once in the League Cup. And we got beaten seven nil. <laughs> and I remember just I remember leaving the stadium that night thinking that's that's the level, you know, that is the standard of world class players. Yeah. And then we played them probably about three months later in the FA Cup and we were one nil up with ten minutes to play. And uh they had they had like Yaya Toru was playing, David Silva was playing, Samir Nazi was playing, James Milner. And then they just switched it on for the last 10 minutes and uh, they banged it in two and they beat us 2-1. But Lampard came off probably with about 15 minutes to go and I was on the bench. And uh, I could just see that the clock was ticking down and it was getting towards 93, 94. And there was a bit of aggro between him and Pellegrini because he'd been whipped off. And the final whistle went and we'd, Obviously, we're naturally quite down that we've been beaten 2-1, but I was straight over to, to Lampard to get the shirt, bearing in mind that the family were all massive Chelsea fans. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a nice bit of memorabilia. It's, it's something nice to look back on. It's just the wrong shade of blue. It's, it's not the dark Chelsea, but it's the light Man City one. Yeah. Um, what was Frank like? Lovely, lovely guy. Um, I'd actually met him in Manchester probably about earlier on that season and we'd drawn them in, in the League Cup and I wouldn't be somebody for going up and, and nudging people but Frank Lampard is, is a god in my house yeah. so I yeah. had to go up and I actually had a two minute conversation there with them then and then after the game and just you know you wouldn't expect to get into too much detail and conversation but for somebody who wasn't in the best of form by being whipped off early in the game um, was very gracious, you know, wished me the best of my career and just very encouraging and an all around nice guy. Yeah. And in, in saying that, you, you just sort of alluded to that, that you play against players who are world class. Was that Man City team the best players you've ever played against? Yeah. Yeah, without, without a doubt. Um, I, I just remember Yaya Torre and Samir Nasri being so in tune with what was going on in the game and just an unbelievable awareness of what was around them, where the space was and I always just remember Yaya Torre. Yaya Torre didn't call for the ball. He clicked his fingers. I remember thinking, that is so bizarre. But even the click of the finger, people were able to pick up where he was. And just how in sync the likes of Nasri Silva, Yaya Torre were, you can't underestimate the first touch that these guys have. The the pace, the power, the strength, I always think is something that is underestimated, but just complete footballers. Have you ever tried clicking your fingers at someone in training? Absolutely. <laughs> I was never... Call them for dinner. <laughs> uh, have you got any other member be there actually before? Um, I played against uh, MK Dons in the in the FA Cup and I got Alan Smith shirt. Um it wasn't really one for, for swapping jerseys. Um I've a few nice pictures of people that I would have played with and the likes of Ross Barkley and Mikel Antonio would have played in my Sheffield Wednesday team. Nice. Um, so my career didn't quite amount to where I wanted to get to, but it's nice to say that you were, you were playing alongside people who've gone on to do good things. And maybe on reflection, you realize the level that you did get to and that you were lucky enough to get to uh, and to be somewhat proud of that. So a few nice pictures, but not, not a huge amount of, um, 
of swap shirts of my international jerseys, my international caps from underage. That is something that I'm also quite proud of. Yeah, man, living the dream, you know. Mm. Myself, myself, uh, like I, like absolutely love football. Like I was referred to as a dirt cow, and then uh, Ross was uh, regarded as a, a notorious water boy. <laughs> no joke. <laughs> Goalkeeper, supreme. But uh, we may as well get into it. Like, you obviously started started playing football with Belvedere. Is that correct? Yeah. So uh, I would have had a couple of years at Cherry Orchard and Home Farm when I was younger, and then my my formative years were probably with Belvedere from the age of thirteen to say the age of seventeen. It was yeah. probably the most important move I made from Cherry Orchard to Belleville because at Cherry Orchard I was playing alongside Connor Clifford who was very much the golden boy at our age group yeah he went to Chelsea he went to didn't Chelsea, he? Chelsea yeah. Yes, so yeah I was somewhat your dream the, yeah exactly and I'm really good friends with Connor but I was somewhat in, in the shadows of Connor when I was playing schoolboy football so going to Belvedere was important for me because it allowed me to create my own identity and I was under the tutorage of a fellow called Jimmy Jackson who would have been very very um, instrumental in my career and, and educating me on the game and um, I guess getting the most out of myself. So re- really good schoolboy team. Uh, Steam trainer, who you lads might know, yeah, been involved in that. We won two All Irelands. We won a couple of leagues, um, and from there, it, it was just it was really really enjoyable. It's probably the most fond memories that I have of playing football because at schoolboy level, it's with your friends, it's with your pals. Yeah, you will get down when you lose, but it, it's not life or death. Yeah, and you also went to Belvedere School as well. That's a, a double Belvedere loyalty as well. Double Belvedere, yeah. <laughs> so it was it was very much a, a rugby school. Yeah, that's the thing. So, uh, football isn't isn't probably at the forefront, but uh, would one hundred percent stand by saying that the school has, has shaped the person that I am today, and um, a lot of people that I'd still be close to, whether that be friends or or teachers, and uh, a really nice environment to. To, to grow up in but football is definitely not the P1 in there it's all about all about the ruggers and yeah. did they try and throw you in at out half they, no they didn't I think if I played out half the centres wouldn't have seen any of the ball because it would have kicked absolutely everything <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you ever play rugby at all then no I didn't I was actually in Paris on week one in first year with uh, an Irish side playing in the Parc de France in a tournament called the Denominations Cup so I had a bit of a pass from the school that I was playing at an elite level and the two, even with regards to training times and match times, were never, it was never going to be feasible. Yeah, well, that's understandable, yeah. Mm. Yeah, because it's compulsory there sort of in first year to give it a go, wasn't it? Yeah, well, they would expect that yeah, everybody so. would would uh, at least have, have a go at it. But, I, I, you know, rugby uh with the football career was was probably not going to to work out in regards to where I wanted to take my football anyway yeah and then like, like well I think a lot of stuff that happens about as well to get like people really invested in the school and empowered that like almost make the school a team which is cool in a way because I remember like mm. myself and Ross we'd go to Belleville games and watch them because we knew some of the lads on the junior cup teams and senior cup teams and everyone would be like singing the Belleville chants whereas like when a Fintons, we went to Fintons mm. and all of them just uh so I'd hope and people would like be slagging your own school be slagging your playing. So it's uh, <laughs> it's funny, like but uh <laughs> what's, what's that Belvo song with the thing? It, it reminds me of, like God Save the Queen or something. Oh god, you're uh... Eve Belvo. No. It's like in God We Trust oh, or something, isn't it? Own, only in God. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me of, like God Save the Queen when like the whole school sings it at the rugby games. I'm sure for people on the outside looking in. Uh, and I know in particular with senior cup and junior cup people would say it's very cultish and, and the school might look a bit that way but I, I can stand by saying when you're involved in the, in the school and the opportunities they give you not just in sport but in regards to the community in regards to your education uh, I'd have no hesitation in sending my kids if I have boys to, to the school because I've really really fond memories there yeah well the camaraderie is just so important as well especially when you're younger trying to find your way but like um at what age were you then paul when you're like right i could actually make this a career and like i'm gonna gonna take it to the next level yeah i somewhat bottled it early on and in, in life at, at 15 i had a couple of offers um to leave school and go to the uk at about four or five contracts you're, you're yeah. gonna have to tell us who like yeah so i went over to nottingham forest when they're in the championship Crew Alexander in the championship 
Reading, Birmingham, and I'm missing one, I can't think off the top of my head. But it wasn't something that I really wanted to do. I didn't want to, to pack up at 15. I, I was quite a young 15 year old as well. Um, yeah, you're like just, is it January, February? I'm, I'm February, but I, yeah. I just mean even in the maturity wise, like I was quite a, a young lad. I was in no way ready to, to uh, leave home and, and uproot and pack my bags and, and just go. So it wasn't something that I was ever really going to do. So I stuck it out and I did my leaving cert. And then when I finished my leaving cert, things were going really well on the schoolboy side of things. And uh, I went over and trained with Burnley, who'd just been promoted to the Premier League. Owen Coyle was in charge and things went really well there. I went over with my parents and discussed the contract. And long story short, I didn't take it. Uh, I had a couple of offers in the League of Ireland from the likes of Bowes who were going really well. But UCD was always something that I was quite keen on. Uh, one, I was able to get my education, but two, they had a manager in Martin Russell who I was uh, very fond of, who saw the game the way that I saw it and played it the way that suited my strengths. What way, so, what way was that now? I, I was never going to be a combative type of midfielder where, uh, you know, harrying and hassling players wasn't really my strength. I needed to be on the ball as much as possible. Um, physically, I wasn't the biggest. And I wasn't the quickest either, so I needed people to play to my feet. I needed uh, probably technical players around me to get the best out of me. And Martin, anybody who played with Martin would know that's the way he always wanted to play. Martin went to Manchester United as a youngster and was a really technical player. And that UCD team was was really strong in that department. So I went in there and uh, my career really kick-started from, from that point. Like we... Even in that UCD team, had Andy Boyle, who went on and got capped. We had Ronan Finn, who's won absolutely everything in yeah. Ireland. Uh, Greg Bulger, Kieran Kilduff. Um, just a really, really strong college team. And we went on and won the first division that year. And then I had the guts of two and a half years playing in the Premier Division. And my, my, probably my CV was built there. And... Uh, I started to progress and I started to learn the game and I finished college and when I finished college I was like right let's go like I'm, I'm now ready at 21 to leave Funny enough that you say that because uh, I actually didn't realise that Martin Russell was the manager at UCD at the, UCD at the time because I was actually playing five side with his son who was also called Martin Russell <laughs> uh, in college and I, but I think when I was in college he was actually manager of Pats would that be right? And yeah he's the Pats I think and uh, I actually remember uh, nearly the entire UCD squad because I think one of the first years you joined, uh, the League of Ireland made its way into FIFA. Do you remember that? What was it? Made its way into FIFA, the video game. Oh, okay. I didn't know this. Yeah, yeah. And I used to always pick UCD. Cause oh, like, sorry. I know what you're saying. Yeah. 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 yeah and I used to always pick UCD because like, uh, uh, they were my Irish team. And I used to like, try, I was really, really good at FIFA. I used to try and beat people like they'd have Real Madrid or Barcelona and I'd still try and beat them at UCD. It was the dream. I've, I've been told of late that they're the worst rated team in FIFA this year. Are they? Oh, are they? <laughs> <laughs> uh, like another thing, Paul, like obviously you said that you're like, right, I'm going to stay in and like uh, finish my education. Like obviously some people are going to be tuning in now and the dream is to go and play football like wherever it be now. But um, how important did you find it to stay, complete your education and then go rather than take a chance at 16 and then you could have been finished by 18 not well like not finished finished but like it's it's a it's a difficult one because for me it worked but when you don't go at 16 you are missing out on potentially better coaching better environment you're also full time so you're you're going to be fine tuning your skills and you're also what i find is between the ages like 16 and 18 people tend to develop quite a lot and when I went over I noticed that people who were of my age were physically like shredded and I definitely wasn't yeah. uh, and that's because they were in a full-time environment for such such a long period of time whereas I probably wasn't given that that guidance um here playing schoolboy football in the league of or sorry within Dublin and um, so there are definitely pros and cons to both for me it worked because 
my instinct is that if I went over, I would have been really homesick and um, I wouldn't have been able to focus on football because I would have been just craving to go home. So that's probably something that um, put me off going away. And I was happy with how my life was. I was happy with how my football was going and how I was progressing. So it just worked for me. But that's not to say that for somebody like Troy Parrott, who's gone over at 15 to, to Spurs, who's probably on a really good contract now, who can carve a really good career for himself. Um, that's not to say that, that way doesn't work either. But what it did give me was it gave me a nice blanket, uh, almost like a, a safety net underneath me that if it didn't work out, I would always be able to turn back and you know, finish off my education or use my education then to, to uh, start my new career, which is for whatever reason that has has happened to me so I was lucky in that sense that when I did finish playing I was like okay I've got a business degree behind me that's going to be a nice little first step on the ladder it's a nice platform to then start something new yeah like also you you went when you eventually did move over like you, you were a man as well you know what I mean mm-hmm. so you know you say that all right and yes that is very true and I was much more mature going over at that age but the biggest difference between going at 18 and 21 was the value of my contract because I had played uh, the guts of 100 senior games here. You're, you're then viewed as a first-team player. So my contract at 21 uh, against Sheffield Wednesday was 10x what I was offered at 18 from Burnley. Oh, wow. That's very, very impressive. That's one thing I actually wanted to touch base with you on. When you went over and signed for Sheffield Wednesday and then you came back to Ireland, uh, did, did your friends or like people who knew you then think you're all of a sudden like a multi-millionaire because they were playing professional football? The perception of wages. I, I could have told people I was on 20 grand a week and they probably would have believed me. Um, the perception of, of football and what people earn is sometimes madness. Like, don't get me wrong, the salaries in the championship are really good. And I think the average salary now is, is about 16K a week, which is huge. Yeah. But... Uh, it's not Premier League wages. You know, people would think 30, 40, 50, 60 K and that's yeah. consistent around um, the different leagues. But I had, I have, and I've always had quite a, a close knit group uh, of, of friends and my family have been unbelievable for me throughout. Um, so I tried not to get swayed into, uh, you know, getting caught up in the whole glamour the money side of things it was it was a nice value add to have now that you were you were getting paid quite substantially to do something that you love but with that and with the extra money and as your salary grows well or any other job so too does pressure and mm. um, so there's something nice about being on a couple of hundred quid in the league of ireland that you don't have to worry about certain elements. And then there's obviously the huge bonuses of playing at a higher level on higher salaries, but that does come at a price too. Yeah. But also when you were playing in the championship and then you just compare it to the Eritrea League, like it, is there a huge difference in standards or like a, how could you actually, how can you gauge it for like ourselves or people listening? The, the, the difference. Gauging it is hard. What I do remember is when I first went over, we used to do like rondos in training uh, where it was like, two guys in the middle and you're trying to keep the ball between six of you. I remember the first week I was like, I cannot keep the ball here because everybody is so much sharper. People's touch is definitely better. People's understanding of the game, people's ability to read what you're going to do. Um, so something that I might have done and disguised the past in the League of Ireland, when I was trying that in the UK, people had seen it so many times and their football IQ is so strong that you go to do it and it would just get caught out. So you, yeah. you nearly had to adapt. Um, and the pace of the game is probably probably what, what stands out too. So there is, without a doubt, a very large jump uh, from, say, the League of Ireland Premier Division to the, the Championship. And just mistakes get punished. That's what I find. If, if you make a mistake at, at that level, it's cutthroat because the, the players have so much quality on the ball and there's so many quality players that they're just able to take advantage of it and it, it is hard like Dundalk went on an unbelievable run in, in Europe Dundalk could potentially do okay in the championship they might it, it's hard to say would they stay up I, I don't know but like uh, 
it, it's hard to say exactly where our league here sits over in the UK. You know, Dundalk are, are a good example, but then there's also teams who are way off Dundalk's level within our own league. So yeah. it's, it's, hard, it's hard to place exactly where, where it sits. Yeah. It's because it's so competitive in the championship as well. Mm. Mm. Definitely. I, think it's, I actually think, in a weird way, the championship is one of the hardest leagues in, in the world to win because there's so many different, like, t- there's always about seven or eight teams uh, who, you know, have the opportunity to win it or get promoted each year. And I always think, I always look at it, you know, when you see, like, the pundits do their, like, prediction of the table. <laughs> like, the championship's always a mile off. You know what I mean? The Premier League, you can sort of go, right, well, there's the top six. There's sort of seventh to twelfth. And there's the relegation battlers. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you might get one or two teams that surprise you, but you'd be close enough to spot on. It's 46 games as well. So it's just relentless. It's literally like Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday. Um, And it just comes at you week after week. And it's so draining. The one thing that I would say, I played in every league outside of the Premier League when I was there. If you gave me an option of playing in the Championship or League 2, I know which one I'm picking. Because League 2 and League 1 are difficult. It's very, very physical and it's almost like a scrap. Whereas even in the championship, you have got a lot of football playing teams and you have a lot of almost European players and foreign players who aren't going to be as physical. Um, so from my experience playing, it, playing in the lower leagues, the higher you go, almost the easier it gets because you've got better players around you. The style of the football is different. Um, it's, it's just a different environment. The pitches are better. The stadiums are better. Like some of the pitches in League Two in December, January time can be like beaches. And you try to play football and it's almost like a 90 minute, it's nearly like a mall at times. What, um, like obviously when going from UCD and then going to Sheffield Wednesday and like Sheffield Wednesday are like a, are a massive club. Like, um, when you, when you, when you first like arrive at Sheffield Wednesday, like, what what are the, like the huge differences that you see, and then you're just like wow, like oh, like from like training to like even the food or or like the preparation is it just another level totally? Yeah, yeah, it, it might be different for somebody who's going from say Shamrock Rovers to Sheffield Wednesday, but the fact that I was going from UCD, which was albeit we were part we were full time in a way, we were still a part time club. So just the whole environment and the whole daily routine is something that you need to get used to from walking into training to knowing that your training fit's going to be there to then go and training. Somebody's cleaning your boots, you walk in, your food's prepared. So your breakfast and lunch is there. Uh, there's a chef on site. The pitches are incredible. Um, pretty much anything you can ask for as, as a professional footballer is given to you from uh, sports science to uh, playing to your training gear, your boots, everything is, is supplied for you. And it's there to set you up for success. And that is very different to cleaning your own gear and getting ready for training at UCD. Um, but probably what stands out most is, is the match day. Like the match day experience, Sheffield Wednesday, Sheffield as a whole revolves around the two football clubs. Yeah. Um, the, tell, us about, tell us about that now. Mm. Yeah, yeah. so my league debut was, was against Leeds in the Yorkshire Derby and there was 30,000 people at it. And I'd gone from... <laughs> nice, easy game to start with, you know? Yeah, like I, I'd gone from... I think my last game might have been against Derry in the bowl and you could have had 900 people at it. Uh, so that was... It was just crazy in regards to the, the stadium. Like Hillsborough's obviously... Um, steeped in history yeah. for, for good or bad reasons um, and the place is just bonkers about football and they really don't like Leeds Leeds would, would sit just under Sheffield United in regards to rivalry it wasn't something that I thought about uh, my confidence was really high at the time I'd probably been at, at the club maybe four or five weeks I played against Southampton in the League Cup in Mary's and uh, it had gone relatively well. We were beaten 2 0, but I was starting to find my feet and I started thinking, I-, I, can, I can support myself at this level. I've got more than enough. Um, and for whatever reason, I didn't think about it too much. I, I played beside 
uh, Ross Barkley that night in midfield and we absolutely ran the show. Michael Brown was playing for Leeds. It was just, there was so many emotions going on, but for whatever reason, I was so confident in myself, I didn't really notice it. And it's only when I, I look back, I thought, geez, that was, that was something else. Like that game was everywhere because it was the game where the Leeds fan came on and hit Chris Kirkland the punch when the goal went in. So the game was everywhere. And I was kind of, I was, I was 21, I was young, and I was just kind of going with the flow. Yeah, uh, that's a very young centre midfield partnership as well. Yeah, Barkley was probably... 19? Uh, 18, 19 at the time, okay. yeah. He came in and uh, I think he played 13 games and scored seven or eight goals. It was just crazy stuff. He does have an eye for a goal, in fairness to him. Um, obviously, Sheffield, uh, it's known as a steel city, and it was quite industrialist back in the day. I don't know if it still is. I've, I've never been. But did it have a real working class vibe to it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there wouldn't be, um, <clears throat> you know, when, when I think of Dublin, when I think of the companies that are here and the Facebooks, the Googles, the Fitbits, uh, that's not there in Sheffield. And Sheffield is still very much the, a lot of the business would still revolve around steel and steel obviously isn't um, in demand like it was maybe 50, 100 years ago. So there, it is very working class. And that's what I mean by the, the city revolves around the football. People, people live for the weekends and they live for going to Hillsborough or um, Bramall Lane. And there's, there's something quite nice about that because it is a real uh, well-supported club within the city. Whereas if you go to Chelsea or Man City, you're, it, it's so global now that it's almost disconnected. Whereas you. everything... Bramall Lane and Hillsborough are five, ten minute drive away from each other. You're living within the football club. Like everywhere you go, people know what's going on with regards to the two football teams. They would know who the players are. Uh, there's just a nice, a, quite a nice connect between the fans and the club. Now, Sheffield Wednesday had obviously come from being in the Premier League and having Carboni and the Canio. So the expectations were really high. Um, so it's great when it's going well and you can certainly feel the heat when it's not. What was it like uh, walking around Sheffield or, or, and living there? Like, did you live in a house or did you live in an apartment? And like, would, would people come up to you and be like, say stuff to you all the time, being like, you better win this weekend? <laughs> um, I, lived, I lived in apartments and I lived just down the way from um, the ground. And yeah, listen, what, what I found is that the, the Yorkshire people are very like our own in regards to being very chirpy, really friendly. Um, of course they'd say hello and it was, it was something that was weird and we got getting used to because we never had we didn't really have fans at UCD so you, you've gone from having no fans to to people almost looking at this like a religion so really friendly people I've, I've good memories from being in Sheffield and yeah you would you would get stopped the odd time but um, just nice nice people did you get did you, did you get homesick much when you were there I know you said you you thought you would when you were younger, but when you got to that age? Maybe now and again. And I think when things are going well, you don't think about it. Um, but I, I spent, particularly my second season, I would say I sat on the bench for 90% of the games. Um, and I would say 89% of that 90, I didn't come on. So it got to a stage where I was almost on the bench at grounds and thinking, I'm, I'm not going to be used here. I'm nearly here to watch the game. And when you're almost got nothing to, to fulfill your week, yes, you play in reserve games and you do your best there, but I wasn't there to play reserve games. I wanted to be involved in the first team. Um, and when I wasn't playing, you almost don't have anything to aim for at the end of your week. And it can become a bit monotonous and, going through the motion and that's probably when I started to to think you know I, I need to get home here even just for a weekend to to catch up change the environment um and then almost get myself going again so that was difficult but I was now 21 22 23 uh I had my own space in Sheffield my girlfriend moved over in the second year so that helped too um but no I was I was okay I was definitely in a better position at that age, then maybe I would have been, had I not been playing at 18, 19, things might have been a bit more difficult. Yeah. And then, yeah. yeah, I was just going to go, 
Uh, strangely enough, the current Sheffield United uh, manager, Chris Waller, took a chance on you and brought you to Northampton. Uh, what was it like uh, working with him? And do you think he could actually be the manager, Premier League manager of the year this year? The job he's done with Sheffield United is incredible. It's unbelievable. Uh, we, we, Northampton was a strange one for me because the last two years at Sheffield Wednesday, I didn't play an awful lot. So when I was released from my contract, I came home and um, I wasn't exactly looked after by my agent at the time. And I changed agent and he said, go over and train with Northampton and see what you, you feel and see what you, you think of it. I was now 23, 24, and I was thinking to myself, I don't necessarily want to go on trial. Um, you know, I've, I've built up quite a CV. I would like to have a contract in front of me. But I knuckled down. I went over and trained with, with Northampton. I really liked it. Thought they had a good team, good vibe, nice manager, good assist to manager and Alan Nil as well, and I signed. So I actually signed one week before the season began, which meant I was really far behind in regards to pre-season and my fitness levels. Yeah. So I spent the next three weeks really getting up to speed, started my first league game on the Saturday, and then on the Wednesday, ruptured my ACL, LCL, MCL, and put me up for the season. So my, my interactions with um, Chris Wilder weren't massive in regards to playing, but what that did enable me to, to almost sit back and see was the way he managed the group of players and how he managed the team. And what I would say is that he managed to get the best out of people. Um, not hands-on on the training ground, and not many managers are over there, unless they're a head coach. But a very good one-to-one motivator and a very good in regards to knowing when to, when to put the foot in with the team and, and to ask for more and knowing when to be somewhat compassionate and say, okay, it's a bad result. We'll, we'll get going again next week. And I think that's probably something that... Uh, is most valuable in regards to managing people at that level is knowing when to turn it up and knowing when to turn it down. And he did that really well. The other thing that he does very well is that he can pick a player. I'm not saying that because he signed me. Um, but he, he knows what players he needs to fit into his system and his system has managed to get him results. Now, we didn't play with the overlapping fullbacks, but... Uh, we had a really strong League Two team and we ended up winning that season with like 100 points. Um, and that really kick-started for him from there. He, he got his move back to his boyhood club with Sheffield United and the journey they've been on with United. I, I couldn't sit here and say that based on what he'd done in Northampton, you could envisage him going to the Premier League with Sheffield United and being as successful as, as he is. But if you're asking me, is he the Premier Manager of the Year? Probably at this moment in time, yes, because... For somebody to take a team from League One to almost on the brink of European football within the Premier League, working with players that not many of us would know had they not been playing in the Premier League is, is just an incredible achievement. Yeah. For honest, me and Barry, I think, did a, like a Premier League prediction video at the start of the season. I think we both had Sheffield United like rock bottom. <laughs> I think we were looking at being like, right, Dave. Uh, they were Carl like Robinson and um, McGoldrick in front and McGoldrick hadn't scored a goal for Ireland so we were like not a chance and yeah. next thing you know like <laughs> you know what I mean like their, their players have really gone above and beyond like it's incredible to see and uh, it's almost Leicester-esque in a way you know what I mean it it's, is. It's, it's, it that, is. it's that impressive you know what I mean like mm. they're they're toe and toe with Manchester United at the moment mm. Mm. Paul, just to sort of wrap up the Sheffield, Sheffield Wednesday, uh, your time there uh, before we get into your injury. Um, did you find that, like being Irish, that, like and not and not be, and not having like more being Irish, that, like oh, he he'd be easier to leave him on the bench rather than having like some sort of European or South American player that, or would the, would that play any part? Because like we all know the way like certain certain Irish players, if they were English, they'd be way more expensive. For instance, like Robbie Brady. Yeah, there's, there's probably an element of that in regards to English players, but do I feel as if that was the reason I was not playing? Not really. Um, there, there wasn't quite a fit. Uh, at the start of the second season, I didn't go out and loan to Bury, and uh, the club wanted me to. And <clears throat> The reason I didn't go was because I was told there was other options, and I wanted to wait out and see what those other options were. Bury had just come out of administration. They had a truckload of new players, 
and it seemed like quite a bad fit. Uh, I'd been on loan to Tranmere the season before, who were in the playoffs of League One. Well, I was thinking to myself, why would I drop down to the bottom of League Two when I yeah. was at the top of League One? I played in the Championship last year, and that worked against me. And I had a certain falling out with Dave Jones, who was in charge, and that meant that I went down the pecking order. Um, yeah. And then when he got sacked, Stuart Gray is number two got the job, so there wasn't really a change in the regime. Uh, which meant then that I, I still was quite out of favour. You know, where I kind of lost my head a bit was there was loan moves came in. And Paul Cook was at Chesterfield at the time and he wanted to take me there and he'd see me and he, he put offers in. And I knew Paul Cook because Paul Cook tried to sign me at Sligo when I was at UCD. So I was hearing it from the horse's mouth that we're putting offers in, we want to take you on loan and Sheffield Wednesday won't let you go out. And I was like, oh, I was like, what? I was like, I'm not playing here at Sheffield Wednesday. Why are they not letting me go? Were they, were they looking for a fee? Supposedly some teams look for a fee. Yeah, they do. They look, they look for a percentage of, of the wage to be covered. But my, my pushback was, well, if you're not going to play me here, even if it's only 10, 20, 30% of my wage are covered, that's better than nothing. Because you're going to have to pay me full whack and you're not playing me here. Um, but Stuart Gray's reasoning for not letting me go was that if I went down, he'd have to put an under 23s pair on the bench and he didn't want to do that. I got you. So that gave me a bit of head loss um, because I knew uh, Stuart actually rated me as a player, but for whatever reason, didn't quite trust me to go mix it in his side. So that kind of worked against me. And that's really what happened for the last two years. I don't think my nationality worked against me. Um, uh, it's more so of the just the dynamic between myself and the management team that were in place. Yeah, uh, like uh, as we know, like you'd be like a confidence player as well. So like hearing all that stuff, that obviously must mess with your head. Um, like uh, uh, as you just referenced earlier, playing for Northampton, you had a like horrific injury. Um, couple of things I want to touch on there. Like obviously, <laughs> it's like it's um, mental health awareness week. Mm-hmm. And then also bear in mind, you've completed your college, you got your degree as well going there. When that happened and you, you, you found out exactly what happened, like what went through your mind? Because I'm sure everything, like, I'm sure, yeah, exactly what went through your mind. Yeah, well, when initially happened, I'll, I'll never forget the pain. I'll never. Can you tell us exactly what happened? If yeah, so it was, it was a one, okay. it was one v one in training. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, I wasn't the quickest. So 1v1s wasn't exactly something that I looked forward to. Uh, I had the ball on the outside of my left foot and I just changed direction really quickly. So if you can imagine I was left footed, the ball on the outside of my left foot, change it with the inside. My knee has extended out over the outside of my ankle and I've felt a click and a big pop. And then what the surgeon said is your body's reaction is to send it back the other way. So the first movement has ruptured my ACL and then the next movement has ruptured my MCL and LCL. And I damaged, I, I ruptured the meniscus and the, the cartilage at the same time. And I remember just falling to the ground and I couldn't believe the pain that was going through my body and my knee. And I just remember shouting, don't touch it, don't touch it to the physio. Yeah. Um, and at that moment in time, I wasn't obviously aware of what had happened. So I was holding back tears in case the lads were thinking, this boy's crying on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> is it a matter how you have to like think yeah. that so that's what you're thinking yeah, that but, was going like, through my brain I was like don't cry like if I'm only out for don't, two don't cry Barclays over there no, yeah, I'm I'm, <laughs> if I'm only out for two three weeks here I don't want the lads thinking who is your man that we're after bringing in here Drenta is <laughs> going to tell all the lads of Real Madrid <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry go on, go on. Um, but from there I, I got a scan and an MRI and um there was a lot of swelling in my knee and anybody who's had a, an ACL injury, swelling's never a good sign. So I kind of knew that it wasn't great. But I remember sitting down on, on the physio bed and one of the lads had a similar injury before me and I asked him, you know, how long are you out? And he's like, nine, between nine and 12. And I was like, okay, that will get me back for just after Christmas. And then I'll get the tail end of the season. I'll try to get another contract. And he was like, no months. And I was like, oh no. I'd only signed a one-year deal at Northampton. And this was, this was trying to get me going again off the back of having two bad years at Sheffield Wednesday. Yeah, getting the games you needed. 
Yeah, and obviously my time went on to win the league. Uh, I, if I had played and I only had a one-year deal, I'd be in a really good position to either A, renegotiate, or B, get a move somewhere. Um, but I was devastated. I was absolutely devastated. Uh, the operation was just as bad as the actual injury. I had the guts of like 45 staples in my knee. I had two massive grafts, one from my kneecap and one from my hamstring. To Because ligaments don't repair, you have to retie them. Um, and I just, I was really immobile for probably two and a half, three weeks, not sleeping, pain was really bad. Um, and the have, you, have you ever had a long injury before this as well? Sorry for no, no, not one. And then like from playing football all the time and you never even think about that stuff and then that to happen, like, yeah. Like, and what, the irony, what, was sort of, what was sort of going in, what was going through your head as well? The irony of it is that I spent a lot of that off season, not bulking up, but strengthening my body and strengthening my legs. My legs were stronger than they'd ever been. I was squatting more than I'd ever. I was deadlifting more than ever. I felt strong in my legs, and it was just that change of direction that, that really um, that really done me. But what, what was your question there? Like, uh, just, like, like only, only because like, this week it is, like Mental Health yeah. Awareness Week, and I was just like, just when, you, when you're hit with a blow, that, that, that devastating to like, like your life as well. You know I mean? You can't walk mm. around the place. Like, what, um, yeah, what know, were you like, like about six months later? Like when you're, you you haven't played football for six months. Yeah, I had I'd be open enough to say I had some really really dark days. Um, the the repetition it can kill you. Um, with regards to the same exercises every single day, the training ground and the stadium were actually away from each other at Northampton. So I did my rehab at the stadium, and the lads trained at the training ground. So I was almost. I wouldn't say ostracized from the group, but when they're all in the team environment working away like you're used to, I was by myself working one to one with the with the um, sports scientist. So that was that was difficult. Um, probably in February March time, the girl I was going out with that relationship finished, and probably about a week later, I was told that my contract wasn't going to be renewed. And I was just like, oh my God, my life is literally falling apart here. And, and Ross like, Barkley unfollowed you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but but I, was, I, was, I was like, it's not nice as a footballer in particular, yeah. being in the last couple of months of your contract, being told that it's not going to be renewed because that just sparks uncertainty and you don't know where your next deal is going to come from. I didn't know if I was going to be in Ireland, in England. I didn't know if football was going to be something for me. Um, yeah, but whereabouts is Northampton from when uh, Sheffield as well? Was it, is it far away? Did you have to North, move? Northampton's an hour from, from London. So okay. I had to move completely down south. I had to furnish a house um, that I'd moved into. I then had to pack up and sell all that furniture. I had to move out of the house because I wasn't going to be at that club. I had to move all my stuff home. Uh, driving from Oxford to... I lived in Oxford to, to Hollyhead. And then I'd come home and sit in a room, work to try to get myself fit again and then try to plan out what was going to be next, whether that was going to be in Ireland, England, in football, outside of football. But when I went in to see the surgeon, <clears throat> uh, Danny Welbeck had been in before me and Vincent Company was in after me. So I was like, okay, I'm in good hands. Yeah. But his words, and I'll never forget it because I started laughing after. And if I get nervous, I start to laugh. He said, yeah. this is on a scale of not too bad to the worst I've ever seen. He said, this is one of the worst I've seen. And I was like, oh, shit. Um, but he always said to me, you won't know until you get back playing whether or not it was successful or not. And I signed for Shamrock Robs and only played two games. So I was never able to get back. Anytime I trained when he blew up, um, I had further damage to me. I had another operation. And when they opened me up, I was basically told, either stop now or you won't walk in 10 years. And I was like, okay. And when I, when I was told that at 25, 26, that was enough for me to say, I'm back now in the League of Ireland. As much as I value the league and as much as I enjoy the league, my goal was always to play in England and play at as high a level. And I think... If I had gone to the championship and then dropped back down and my body wasn't quite allowing me to do what I was once able to do, that would lead to frustration. And then also, your health is your wealth. And whether it's mental health or physical health, I didn't want to be in a position whereby 
I'm sitting in a, in a chair because I can't walk. And if I have kids, I want to be able to get up and get after them. And I want to be able to enjoy life after football. And I was told if I continued to play, I wouldn't be able to do that. Um, but going back to, to the whole mental health aspect of it, it's an absolute roller coaster um, because all that matters in football is our results. And in order to get results, you need fit players. If you're not fit, you're not much use. And you have to, you have to nearly accept that. Um, yeah. Well, that's not nice, or that's not to say that it's, it's a nice feeling when you're struggling away by yourself. So I, I had really a, a good lot of dark days, and even after difficult days, and even today I still have difficult days. There was a stage there recently I was saying to my housemate that I'm literally going to bed every night and I'm dreaming about playing football, and I wake up and I should be going into a training ground. And I'm going into an office. So that's, that's not to say that I don't value what's going on in my life. It's just to say that things are still difficult and it's still a process. It's almost like a grieving process whereby it takes time. I'm just lucky that I've, I've quite good support structures around me, particularly in my family that help me get through it. Yeah. What are you doing now, Paul? So a bit, of, a bit of this, a bit of that. I work with Enda McNulty, um, who is probably best known for the work that he's done with the RFU and Menster Rugby in regards to uh, <clears throat> performance management and sports psychology. But, the majority of the business lies in the corporate world. So I, I manage the relationships and I do sales within and this business. And the nice part of it is that uh, a portion of our work is still working with sports teams. Um, and we're working with a Premier League team over in the UK. So that involves going over there and it puts me back into the environment uh, of sport, which, which, which is nice. And then outside of that, I've obviously got a bit of TV and a bit of radio that I do with RT and Air Sport that, Keeps me involved in the game. That's, uh, the, that's nice. the thing, yeah. That's, that's the thing. Like that is the thing. At the end of the day, like you, I know he can't play, but being a part of it in some sort of way, like that, definitely must must help the blow. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say I felt like a victim for a while, but I did feel a bit like, why me? Yeah, man, I felt mad. Like, like how can you not? Like, you know, it wasn't as if somebody went and and two footed me in training and. And I could blame that person. This was literally a change of direction whereby my knee went one way and my body went the other. And I, you know, even if I go back and I think, why was I not allowed to go out and loan at Sheffield Wednesday at that time? Things could have been so different uh, to my knee injury to thinking it's just not fair. So when I, when I finally decided to stop playing, I didn't want to know the game. I, I, didn't, want to, I didn't want to watch it. I didn't want to talk about it because it was too it was too touchy a subject um from what had happened and it's only natural that your identity becomes a footballer so when you're at family gatherings when you're out with friends when you're on a night out people are always asking you about football so even if you try to get away from me you're always brought back into it so i i I just wanted to distance myself away from the game for a bit um because i didn't like it as, as simply as I did not like football. I didn't like what it had done yep. to me. I didn't like the journey that I'd had to go through and I didn't like the experiences that I'd had to experience. But I would say that the TV and the radio, and I did a bit of coaching back down in Belvedere, <clears throat> that helped to, to reignite my love for it. And I'm closer now to being able to accept uh, what it is that happened. But I don't think until players that I played with have retired, will I be able to kind of completely say, okay, I'm done with that. Yeah. Um, it's bad, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, I didn't know where you were, like, I mean, I don't know, I'm sort of blown away with that because, like, obviously, like, you, but at the end of the day, when you look back at it, like, you did play the dream, like, you know, you, you went over, mm. like, mm. You, you got to, you got, you got to, you got to do what you were doing and, like, a lot of people would have taken that. So, when, like, when you look back through everything, like you, you, you did exactly what you wanted to do. You, you like you got your degree. Like you went over and played with Sheffield Wednesday, one of the biggest, like most well-known stadiums, whether for good or for bad. You said, and then like you got to live it up in the League of Ireland as well. And like now you're still involved in the game, which and like it's, you know, what I mean, a lot of people would take that career, like you know. Yeah, the most difficult part is my career almost stopped at 22 because between 22 and when I finished. I wouldn't have played many more than 20 games. Whereas I'd built up probably about 150 
to that point. So uh, there's an almost question of how far could I have gone? You know, what could I have done? And, you know, what on a scale of one to 10, where did I get to in regards to my potential? And I would probably say maybe in the, in around the region of four because your best years as a centre midfielder are going to come between say the age of 25 and 30 when you when you begin to learn the game and you and you, you see the same sort of pictures and you obviously fine-tune your skills so that that's kind of hard to to um to accept but at the same time like you said Barry like, nobody can take those experiences away from me nobody can take that Frank Lampard shirt nobody can take that Sheffield Wednesday shirt I have a League Two winner's medal upstairs. I have a First Division winner's medal. I thought you were wearing it now. With you, see, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's over there. Um, so nobody can take those experiences away from me from playing in front of 30,000 people. Yeah. Uh, I have them behind me. And you know what? You're doing great work now uh, on air sport as well. Uh, I think the League of Ireland is something that's definitely been given a push recently. I saw you on with uh, Johnny McDonald, actually. Nice fella. Uh, big fan. Um, and is that something that you're going to look forward to doing in in the future uh, broadcast and then you know maybe make your way uh, onto you know broadcast full time Uh, it's funny because it just sort of happened when I finished playing I don't know how but I I kind of just stumbled into doing a bit of media work but I do enjoy it I would consider myself as cringy as it sounds a bit of a student of the game um, I'd watch absolutely everything I, I, I like analysing and I like breaking it down and that, wouldn't be, cr- that wouldn't be cringy at all no, matter what. no yeah I know but some people might think oh god don't worry they've, they've stopped watching it ages ago <laughs> <laughs> you got injured it's grand <laughs> <laughs> I love the whole uh, you know possession base being on the ball opening teams up I love sitting down and, and analysing that and I, I guess I get to do that by doing a bit of TV um, I really enjoy the work that I do with both Air and RTE. Um, RTE tends to be a bit more radio, so it's a bit more informal, whereas the TV is, is really, it, it, it's a chance to give people at home a bit of an insight into little bits and pieces that happen that, that give people an edge. And I'm quite an opinionated person, so I enjoy that. Uh, of course, you're always going to get a bit of flack there's almost a certain element of banter to that as well between home and away fans. But it's, it's certainly uh, the next best thing I've gotten to playing. It's, it, I don't, you'll, let, you'll never, ever emulate the, the balls of the adrenaline of playing, but I do get a certain, uh, a certain, I get something out of it, put it that way. Uh, yeah. you know, there's a bit of pressure involved. You're close to the game, there's fans, there's energy. Uh, so that's something that I enjoy. How far it takes me, I haven't really thought too much. I, I'm just enjoying what I'm doing with it. Yeah. Just uh, just another thing as well. Uh, would you ever go over to a Chelsea game, or is, it, is that just sort of weird? Ah, yeah. I've I've been to. I went to Chelsea and Aston Villa early on in the season with Stamford Bridge, and then I went to Chelsea and Tottenham with my dad, North London derby. Um. So that was that was class. Like I I really do enjoy. I went over. Actually, I saw them play Man City as well. So I'm over and back quite a bit I've some close connections within the game still over there um, so Ross Barkley to, yeah, <laughs> yeah this, this was actually Ross more Barkley, yeah. this was more in Man City so like I went around the training ground and I got to see everything that was going on there Man City actually trained the morning of the game before they played uh, Chelsea so even just to get to see that and then into the stadium so uh, that'll be if, almost better than going to some games oh man yeah the, the environment is like I was talking to Sheffield Wednesday training around being good. This is on a different level altogether. Yeah. Uh, everything you could ask for as a player. Like they, they have a hotel site within the training room and the, the rooms are designed based on the player's needs and wants. So if you want a hard pillow, you get a hard pillow. If you want a soft pillow, you get a soft pillow. And that's open for them 24 7. You can see the people fluffing the pillows. <laughs> uh, Paul, like it. Like, I mean, we've, we've held you up for way longer, you know? Like, obviously, if people didn't know in the DMs, you said that I'm only doing for 15 minutes and that's it. <laughs> but, uh, like, I mean, we don't want to take too much of your time. But uh, just to sort of, like, we're obviously going to have to do this again because we're all best mates now. I'm sure people who, hmm. uh, people want to see you back on. But, um, like, obviously, the, the, all the problems going on with COVID-19. Um, what's your sort of thoughts on what's going to happen with the Air League just before we wrap things up? 
Yeah, I, I think we will see football of some form before the end of the year. I read something yesterday that said that we're the only summer league without a plan. Uh, and that is very much linked to the financial troubles that we've been put in in the last 12, 24 months and the packages we've had to draw down from UEFA. But I do think that we will, we will see football of some form um, over the next coming weeks and months. Who I do feel sorry for is the, the players in particular, uh, particularly sure. the full-time players whose contracts are a bit up in the air. It's, it's hard to commercialise our league in regards to stream viewing. So they're going to need support from some association or from a government body or something to get them back up and running. But I think we'll see it. Hopefully now we see it and it sticks as opposed to restarting and then having to press the, the stop button again. But I think we'll see it soon. The dynamic is probably going to be a little different, something similar to what we've been seeing with the Bundesliga. But um, from my point of view, we, we need to get a plan in place soon because um, like anybody, there's jobs at stake there and we want to see the league going on an upward trajectory and, and not a downward and it's time that support was put around the, the people and the managers to try get it to the level that we all want to see it at. Yeah, uh, just one more thing about it because I'm sure Ross wants to ask you something else as well. But uh, like as I did like mention, I think twice now, but um, it is mental health with mental health awareness week, and like I mean, like uh, for people that are listening now, I'm sure there's a lot of footballer and people that love football and have really enjoyed the show because I definitely have. Um, if there's someone at home who's injured now or sort of uh, sort of have gone through what you've gone through, because I'm sure lots of people have, like especially in the game, what would you sort of say to them to just be like keep the, keep the sort of chin up? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What I found that worked well for me, and I wouldn't be uh, one for opening up about my emotions to my family, but was was to just to speak out. Uh, I sought the assistance of people within the PFA um, just to see somebody to speak. And that's not because um, I felt weak or because I felt as if I was really spiraling out of control. It was just because I felt like I needed support at that moment in time. <clears throat> and they they as an association were, were really good to me. I went and I saw a lady, I think I saw her three or four times, and that just helped me with the process of dealing with the injury and dealing with what might lie ahead. And that's the only advice that I, I could really share based on, on my experiences is, is to talk to somebody, whether that's a, a family member or whether that's somebody outside your circle. But if you feel like you are struggling, the best thing you can do is, is talk about it because what you will find is that support is out there in, in, in some way, shape or form. Yeah, Ross, anything else to say? No, any, any good tips? Any good tip for us? I thought that was absolutely beautiful to say. No, I, I do agree, uh, Paul. I think me on a personal level as well. I'm not great at expressing my emotions. So I sort of, you know, pen them up and then like someone will do something bad <laughs> right to me and then I'll, I'll let them know everything that they've done bad to me for the last two months. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, I'll be like, and you left that out, and that time where you didn't pick me up and you said you would, and that time you were never like, you know, yeah, you don't, but, start, uh, you don't have to start out me now on camera, man. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it, it is, it, you know what? I actually think if you sort of, if you do have a problem or if something is getting to you, if you just say it there and then, in a sort of nice, calm manner, it goes a long way. Um, you know, your built up frustration sort of they go away. I, 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 as the saying goes, better out than in. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, here, look, I want to say is everyone that tune in. This is a, I didn't know it was going to go like this. You know, this was uh this is cool. Yeah, you know I mean, I'm sure like I'm going to step away and be like. Jeez, Paul could talk for him. But um, <laughs> Ross, we have another man on our on our five uh, on our five percent of the team. So all we need now is uh, Barclay's number and Drenthe's number, and then we'll win anything. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Paul, thanks a million for coming on, man. Uh, anyone who's checked this out, make sure to follow Paul. He's a legend. Uh, make sure to subscribe as well because we're here every week, and we will definitely have Paul on again. Uh, Paul, anything else to say? No, no, that's all. That's thanks for the time. Really enjoyed that. Did you accept no the worries. Five, the five side invite. <laughs> Uh, we'll see if this invoice gets paid <laughs> <laughs> okay thanks for being for tuning in uh, like comment subscribe and as always stay energized <laughs>